Krishna Krishna Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare
Krishna, Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama. Hare Krishna, dear devotees, please accept my humble obeisances. All glory to Shri Prabhupada. Hare Krishna, Guru Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. All glory to Shri Prabhupada. Welcome everyone to His Holiness Chandra Mali Maharaj's daily call. Thank you so much for joining. Thank you, Guru. Thank you, Maharaj, for joining and attending this call. Uh, uh, so today, is, as I'm aware, um, uh, Maharaj will be discussing Shrimad Bhagavatam, first canto, uh, ninth chapter, and uh, verse thirty-three. And uh, that is Bhushma Deva leaving his body in the presence of Lord Krishna. Uh, so I'm assuming, Guru Maharaj, we are we're discussing the same verse uh, today. You're on mute, uh, Maharaj. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Hare <laughs> Krishna. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya So, uh, passing away of Grandfather Bhishma, chapter 9 of the first canto. Let's see, this is the... Uh, Verse number 33. Sri Bhuvana Kamanantama Sri Bhuvana Kamanantama Varnam Ravigana Gauravara Sri Bhuvana Kamanam Tamalam Varnam Ravikaram Gauravara Amburam Dago Dharthane Papura Lanka Kula Vritta Nanda Bhyan Vijaya Sarke Vatir Asuna Navadya. 
Translation, Shri Krishna is the intimate friend of Arjuna. He has appeared on this earth in his transcendental body, which resembled the bluish color of a tumble crown. His body attracts everyone in the three planetary systems, upper, middle, and lower. May his glittering yellow dress and his lotus face covered with paintings and sandal of pulp be the object of my attraction and may I not desire to the results. Report. When Sri Krishna, by his own internal pleasure, appears on earth, he does so by the agency of the internal potency. His attractive feature of transcendental body are desired in all three worlds, namely the upper, middle, and lower planetary systems. Nowhere in the universe are there such beautiful body features as those of Lord Krishna. Therefore, his transcendental body has nothing to do with anything materially created. Arjuna is described here as a conqueror, and Krishna is described as the intimate friend. Bhishma Dev is on his set of arrows after the battle of Kurukshetra, and he is remembering the particular dress of Krishna, which he put on as a driver of Arjuna's chariot. While fighting was going on between Arjuna and Bhish, Bhishma Dev, Bhishma's attraction was drawn by the green dress of Krishna. And indirectly, he admired his so called enemy Arjun for possessing the Lord as his friend. Arjun was always a conqueror because the Lord was his friend. Bhishma Dev takes the, this opportunity to address the Lord as Vijay Sake, friend of Arjun, because the Lord is pleased when he is addressed conjointly with his devotees who related him in different transcendental humors. While Krishna was the charioteer of Arjuna, sun rays glittered on the dress of the Lord and purple you created by the reflection. Quit jumping around like a monkey. What are you doing? And I've lost the whole. What do you why do you keep playing with your buttons? Just sit still and don't do nothing. While well, Krishna was a chariot, sun rays glittered on the dress of the Lord, and the beautiful you created by the reflection of such rays was never forgotten by Bhishma Dev. As a great fire, he was relishing the relationship of Krishna and his chivalrous humor. Transcendental relation with the Lord in any one of the different humors is relishable by the respective devotees in the highest ecstasy. Less intelligent Mondayers who want to make a show of being transcendentally related to the Lord artificially jump at once to the relationship conjugal love, imitating the damsels of Rajadhan. Such a cheap relation with the Lord exhibits only the base mentality of a Mondayer. Because one who has relished conjugal humor with the Lord cannot be attached to world conjugal ras, which is condemned even by mundane ethics. The eternal relationship of a particular soul with the Lord is evolved. A genuine relationship of the living being with the Supreme Lord can take any form out of the five principal rasas. And it does not make any difference in transcendental degree to the genuine devotee. Vishma Dev is a concrete example of this, and it should be carefully observed how the great general is transcendentally related with the Lord. Don't move it, keep it there. Don't move it. Jai Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadadhar Shivasani Gaur Bhakta Vindam Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare Pancha Kalpa Tarugas Chakriba Sindhu Veda Chapatitanam Bhavane Bhyo Vaishnava Bhyo Namaha Namaha So we're getting a really nice and clear and very graphic description of the transcendental body and dress of the Lord from a pure devotee of the Lord as described by Bhishma Dev and related 
in this particular book for us. Um, Vishma Dev is really amazed and overwhelmed with appreciation that Arjuna is so closely, intimately connected with Krishna that he becomes the chariot driver of his devotion. And therefore, Bhishma Dev takes the opportunity to call Krishna in one of his intimate names, Vishaka Sakya, Vijaya Sakya, friend of Arjuna. Um, he's not envious of Arjuna. He is appreciating Krishna's kindness towards his devotee and how he gives himself completely over to his devotee when the devotee surrenders fully into the, unto the devotional service of the Lord. Yeyatam mam papadyante tamstataiva bhajami aham mamma vartmanu vartante manucha parsha sarvasya aham. Krishna says that that as you approach me, I will reward you accordingly. Everyone follows my path in all respects. So Krishna is actually reciprocating according to the level that we surrender to him. Prabhupada sometimes would say that Krishna reflects our own consciousness based on our own desire. If we take the Krishna consciousness in order to improve our material situation, we may also get some improvement in that material situation, but we will not get the goal of Krishna consciousness. Krishna, Krishna knows exactly the heart of all living entities and he reciprocates accordingly. He's inclined to his devotee and he goes out of his way to protect his devotee, to glorify his devotee, uh, to serve his devotee. He becomes even in a subordinate position to his devotee as to show that my devotee is more important than even myself. Everyone can hear me? Yes, Kamaraj, yeah, we can hear you. Okay. And so the devotee, he likes to glorify the, the devotee who is so close to the Lord. In the material world, when someone is better than us, we feel envious. And that envy causes us unhappiness and it even causes us to act in a very offensive way. But in the spiritual realm, everyone appreciates another person's relationship with the Lord as being better than their own relationship. And when it becomes obvious in this situation, I mean, Bhishma Dev is not a small personality. And because of Bhishma Dev, um, you know, uh, Virodhana was able to fight in the battle. He had no chance to win or even to fight, but because he had Bhishma Dev on his side, he felt that he was going to be victorious. Of course, Bhishma Dev at one point stopped fighting because he understood that it was Krishna's will to protect his devotee and therefore Krishna broke his promise in order to do that. And therefore, he fought directly with Bhishma Dev, which was the desire of Bhishma Dev. Because as Prabhupada says, that one can have a relationship with Krishna in different ways. And here, Bhishma Dev was in the chivalrous humor. And the devotee is satisfied with their own relationship. Sometimes it's understood that in the spiritual world, one's relationship is not fixed. It's fixed, but it's also changeable. So if a devotee wants to serve the Lord in another way, they can simply do that, but they don't do that just to experience their own happiness. They do it in order to please Krishna. 
So knowing the, the mind of Krishna or knowing how to please Krishna, a devotee may also take on a different humor or a relationship, mellow, a sweetness of a sweetness of contact just to please Krishna. Of course, that cannot be done in the material world because um, we basically are, until we actually come to the platform of spontaneous devotional service by the Nuga Bhakti, then we worship Krishna in the mood of Dasya Ras and servitorship. As we develop in our relationship with Krishna, the spiritual master sees the development of his disciple and gradually moves him in the direction by which he can serve the Lord according to his spiritual identity. And this comes at a higher level of spontaneous devotion and service. But when one becomes fixed in one's eternal relationship with Krishna and serves in that way, they will not desire to change into another relationship. Because in the material world, it becomes very difficult to change one's uh, uh, siddha day while one is still in this body. In fact, it's impossible. So one is happy or satisfied here. It says here, any one relationship to a living being with the Supreme Lord can take any form of the five principal losses. And it does not make any difference in this transcendental degree to the genuine devotee. So what does that mean? Every devotee is satisfied in their relationship with Krishna. Although we might, sometimes it says that Madhurya Ras is the concentration of all of the, the mellows of all of the other Rasas in, in its highest form in Madhurya. But still, those in Sakya Ras are satisfied, those in the paternal Ras would not change. So in the same way, um, even those in Dasya Ras will be completely satisfied in service. And here we see Bhishma Dev, he's in one of the sub Rasas, which is called the chivalrous humor, which he has made his main Rasa, and that is to serve Krishna in Dasya Ras in the mood of fighting with Krishna, which is a chivalrous humor because Krishna can fight also, but he, he only can fight when he's devoting. But that fighting is not the kind of fighting he fights with when he kills the demons. That fighting is just a loving relationship in the mood of fighting. Sometimes you see that even in the material world, one will play fight. Although there's affection between the two fighters, they play in that mood of fighting and there's no mean spirit, there's no enmity, there is no death. It is simply done as an art of expression to exchange fighting spirit with each other. And so that is done in the spiritual world, in a loving relationship with his devotee, in the mood of chivalrous, which is one of the sub rasas, but it's it's fueled with the main rasa, which is dashya ras. So we can only get an insight, and this particular purport is so beautiful as it describes so many of the particular natures of Krishna, his dress, um, his relationship with his devotee our relationship with him in the different mellows, um, how he's more potent than the sun as the sun appears in the sky. And it said, just to speak of the Brahma Jyoti, which is the spiritual energy coming from the body of the Lord, it says that if 10,000 suns were to rise simultaneously in the sky, they would probably be equal to the light of the Brahma Jyoti. And that's just the bodily effulgence coming off Krishna's body. So everything about Krishna is so amazingly attractive. And so therefore, a devotee can easily become attracted to Krishna as we, want, we see his transcendental qualities. In the material world, we get attracted to another person because of who they are, what they are, what they do, what are their qualities, something about them that is attracting us to them. But in the material world, people have limited qualities. And even if they have 
a few outstanding qualities, it's in limited proportion. But Krishna has all good qualities in complete, in complete uh, full fullness of those qualities. So how attractive is Krishna? That's why his name, he has so many names, but the name that we give him as the most is Krishna. It means one who can attract everyone. And everyone's attracted to Krishna. But because people are uh, covered with the material energy, their attraction is somewhat clouded by another energy, which is also Krishna's energy, the material energy. Um, so our relationship with Krishna is uh, sweet. It's called rasa. Rasa doesn't have a particular English translation that actually fits is mellow, the word mellow. Mellow is kind of like the sweet mood of, a, of something. Sometimes when you take something to eat, we say, wow, that was really mellow. <laughs> In other words, it was relishable. It has a certain flavor about it that is very pleasing. So rasa means that which is pleasing in different moods of itself in terms of the principal relationships that go on, such as friendship, servitorship, parental affection, conjugal love. And of course, in that in these different relationships, there are other subcategories about that particular rasa. The mood of a child, the mood of a parent, the loving mood of a motherly parent, the loving mood of a fatherly parent, the reciprocation with the child in according to the different um, parental moods being offered. So it becomes quite variegated. And in, in Madhurya Ras also, if we study this science very carefully, we'll see that Everything we're looking for in this material world and more is found in Krishna. <laughs> it is complete, it is perfect, it is satisfying, and it makes the relationships in this world look quite, um, what we say, uh, unpalatable <laughs> or not even worth wasting time in. So this is good because Krishna is... Everything about Krishna is wonderful. And out of all of his qualities that are attractive, his beauty is the most attractive for the devotee. The devotee loves to see the beauty of Krishna in different ways, and Krishna exhibits that. And every part of his body is a, is a, is a part of beauty that exists in and of itself. And when it's combined with all other parts of his body, that beauty expands unlimitedly. So we cannot compare anything in this world to the beauty of Krishna. Sometimes we use material examples just to give a little indication of something beautiful, just as, such as we say lotus, lotus flower. And if you compare all of the different flowers in the world, the lotus is the most beautifully formed flower. It is so transcendentally symmetrical that, and it is so artistically uh, designed that mm, when one sees a lotus flower, they think, oh, wow, that is very, very attractive, very beautiful. It's perfect in all sense. But that's just an indication that we can use in order to get a little bit of an uh, understanding that everything about Krishna is so transcendentally attractive. And even these material examples can't even come close to the attractiveness of Krishna. So get attracted to Krishna and lose attraction, attraction to this material world. Uh, this, the attraction of this material world is simply ephemeral. It is simply based on um, an idea that there's something there that's attractive. Well, what gives any material thing some element of attraction is the presence of the spiritual energy within that material thing. 
But otherwise, it is simply just like you see a beautiful girl or a very handsome man. What about them is attractive is that the soul is there. If the soul wasn't there, that same beauty would be simply uh, just a lump of flesh. And it doesn't have any attraction at all. So it's the soul that gives anything beauty. But compared to Krishna, who is the sum total of all beauty and all attractiveness, everything in this material world is, is insignificant at best. <laughs> okay, get attracted to Krishna. Here we're seeing how Bhishma Dev is fully attracted to Krishna. All he can do is glorify Krishna and glorify Krishna's relationship with his devotee Arjun. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj, thank you so much uh, for the next class. Uh, Mataji, you want to? Yes, yes. Sorry. Sorry, my system was a bit slow. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Thank you, Maharaj, for giving such a nice talk about the different relationships with Krishna and especially, um, you know, informing us what relationship did um, um, uh, Vishmadev had with uh, uh, with Krishna and that is the servitor relationship um, and uh, how did Krishna look when he was in battlefield and how Vishmadev was attracted to uh, Krishna's beauty and his, uh, his dress. Uh, so thank you, Maharaj, for your time and so nicely explaining uh, Vishmadev's attraction to Krishna. And devotees, if you have any questions, comments, realizations, please uh, unmute yourself and ask questions. And it'll be nice to take your darshan as well. So if you can please uh, keep your cameras on. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna Maharaj, Dandavat Pranam. Please accept my humble obeisances. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Question? Dheeraj Prabhu, do you have a question? No, I think he left the call. He just... Oh God, okay. <laughs> maybe, maybe it just got disconnected. Anyone else? Krishna Guru Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. Um, yeah, it's wonderful to see um, uh, these relationships uh, or like um, um, how we are connected um, to the Lord eternally, but um, uh, but we don't understand. We always think in this material uh, conception of life because we don't know exactly um, what uh, how Krishna um, um, is, um, his form is and how, how beautiful he is and uh, so we don't know anything so we always speculate or we always uh, think in the material level as you explained um, in the last part so um, so how to know more about the beauty of uh, Lord Krishna Guru Maharaj um, like um, with our less um, knowledge of uh, this um, so uh, we don't know how to um, ex exactly um, uh, I don't know how to say that, but I, I thought you understood my question. Yeah, yeah there's many descriptions throughout the scriptures comparing Krishna, the transcendental body to various types of beautiful artistic ex expressions that you find both in nature and also unique. I think it's in the 11th chapter of the first canto, there is a description describing the beautiful uh, neck of Krishna compared to a conch shell and it describes it in colors. And I think the verse is first canto 11th chapter verse number two, but I'm not exactly sure if that's the verse. See if you can find it, 111.2. It's very nicely described yes. how Krishna's beauty is being illustrated in that particular verse. Yeah, 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 that's it. 
There you go. There you go. I said, now don't tell me, tell me if this verse is not beautiful. Read it. Shimati. Yes, Guru Maharaj. Um, the translation, the white and fat bowled conch shell being gripped by the hand of Lord Krishna and sounded by him appeared to be reddened by the touch of his transcendental lips. It seemed that a white swan was playing in the stems of red lotus flowers. <laughs> so here's a nice analogy comparing Krishna's touch to the transcendental conch shell and it appeared like a white swan playing in the stems of red lotus flowers. Now that, that's quite unique and quite beautiful. So read something in the purport. Yes, good much. Uh, the redness of the white palm shell due to the lip touch of the Lord is a symbol of spiritual significance. The Lord is all spirit and matter is ignorance of this spiritual existence. Factually, there is nothing like matter in spiritual enlightenment, and this spiritual enlightenment takes place at once by the contact of the Supreme Lord Sri Krishna. The Lord is present in every particle of all existence, and he can manifest his presence in anyone. By ardent love and devotional service to the Lord, or in other words, by spiritual contact with the Lord, everything becomes spiritually reddened like the conscience in the grip of the Lord, and the Paramahamsa, or the supremely intelligent person, plays the part of the ducking swan in the water of spiritual bliss, eternally decorated by the lotus flower of the Lord's feet. <laughs> and so beautifully described yes. here. So these things are not some imagination, right? like in the material world, poets come up with imaginary different descriptions. And of course, they're trying to express something beautiful using their imagination. But this is actual factual reality of the Lord's, when the Lord comes in contact with something, it transforms that into something very attractive. It's just like each and every devotee becomes attractive when they engage in devotional service. Before we were devotees, we may have had some attraction or may not even had any attraction, but as soon as we become devotees, the devotee becomes automatically attractive simply by coming in contact with devotional service, which is Krishna in the form of his internal energy. So everything is beautified, everything is transcendental, everything takes on. Uh, I think in the Brahma Samhita, it describes, you know, Krishna's form in different ways. Kintamiri Prakata Sadma Shukalpa Vipsa Laksana Vitu Suda Vabir Vivali Antam Lakshmi Sarasya Satasam Brahma Sevyamanam Govindamari Purusham Tamaham Vajamu Alo Lachandra Kandata Sangramahu but you know, if you go on with these verses, starting with 29, it's just beautiful descriptions of Krishna. His lotus eyes, his peacock feather, his dress, his smile, transcendental form. Nothing can compare and nothing can be imagined in Krishna. It's not, it's not possible to imagine something like this. So, yeah, just get attracted to Krishna, hear about him. Offer prayers to Krishna, pray to Krishna, become absorbed in learning more about Krishna. His name, his forms, his qualities, his activities, all of these are chintamani. Uh, They're all pure spiritual rasa. All completely full with the attractive qualities that make up Krishna's existence. Yes, Guru Maharaj. Thank you so much, Guru Maharaj. Thank you. Thank you. That was so nectarian, Guru Maharaj, to hear that. Thank you. 
जय श्री माता जी यस यू कैन गो इन Krishna Guru Maharaj, uh, please accept my humble obeisances. Thank you so much for the wonderful class. Like I just want to pick up and start reading again um, descriptions of Krishna. Um, I just wanted to say it's not really a question; it's just a reflection. My regular service, I do some small service at the manor at London, where I show new people to the manor. I give them tours of the manor and explain about the deities. And people that have never come across Hinduism, or some people, you know, have never seen Krishna before, and even then, when they first see the deities, they are so wonderstruck. They they can't move on. They just stand there and stare. So you know, his beauty is so amazing. For us, we sort of sometimes take it for granted, but for new people, um, you know, I take them to the deities, explain a little, and once they see the deities, they don't want to hear anything else. They just want to stand and. And take in his beauty, so yeah. It's, yeah, it's really amazing. Yeah, he's very yeah. For them, it's like another world has just opened up. Something yeah. That yeah. Is, yeah, yeah. I remember when I used to take, I used to do uh, tours of Prabhupada's palace, and we would take them to the different sections of the palace. And there was one study room. Where there was a murti of Shiva Prabhupada sitting at a desk and he's in a position of writing. So we would take these, we would take all these new people who would come from different places in America to see the palace. And then we'd walk in there. And the first thing I would do is just let everybody come in and I wouldn't say anything. And everybody's like, oh, he's writing. I guess we shouldn't disturb him. <laughs> <laughs> so some they get like that. They actually think he's, you know, he's there. <laughs> mm. And I have to tell them, well, that's, you know, he is there, but not in the way you think it is. It's a little different. Yeah, his his energy. So, uh, yeah, that that. Yeah, when we so, take them to Prabhupada's room. Um, one of the other Mataji's who does the same service um, noticed that as soon as people come out and they hear a little bit about the history of ISKCON, she, she, she says their faces are so different. They're lit up because of the energy, you know, yeah. in Prabhupada's room. And just although they can't see it, it's different. They look different just from that small interaction. Yeah, they keep coming. Yeah. Krishna, the more one engages, you see, because they're innocent, they have no preconceived ideas about what they're experiencing, and so they're completely open to whatever happens. Because of that, they get a nice experience, which is quite a quite a change from what they would normally experience. Mm. So it's quite strong. We have a tendency after a while to get a little bit routine. And we just go about, and it doesn't. We don't think, and we're not as open as that. But as we increase our own bhakti and become more and more inclined to Krishna, and become attracted to Krishna, Krishna reveals more of his opulences. One time, Prabhupada was with this gentleman, new man. Prabhupada had strikened him in front of the deities, and Prabhupada was standing there looking, and the man was also looking. And Prabhupada said to him, if you could see, they, if you could actually see, they are having their pastimes right there in front of us. And that is actually happening. Um, I remember one girl, she was, um, she was uh, in Vrindavan. And um, he was st standing there looking, and Radharani had an apple in her hand. And she was holding it and offering it to Krishna. And then she was thinking, boy, I really want that apple. <laughs> so, and the darshan ended, and, and she left the temple. And the next day she came back again and Radharani had another, another apple in her hand. <laughs> so this time she was looking and this time when the, the curtains closed and the majority came 
off the altar and he had the apple in there, his hand. And he said to her, he went right to her. He didn't even know her. And Radharani had directed him to her and she, he said, Radharani wants you to have this apple, but it's not for you. It's for another girl who you know, and she's pregnant. And you give her this apple. She's having trouble with her pregnancy right now. Give her this apple and all her trouble will be gone. And she will have a baby girl. And Radharani says to name the girl after her. <laughs> and this is what happened. So she took the apple. She knew the girl. They were both from the same area, different countries. It was all from the Balkan areas there. She was from... Bosnia, the girl was from Croatia, so she went to Croatia and gave it to her. And she said, uh, she was six months pregnant. She said, here, take this. six weeks pregnant, I'm sorry. She was having difficulty. Here, Radharani wants you to have this. And so she ate the apple and all of the difficulties in the pregnancy went away. She had a very smooth time with the child. And when she was born, was a girl, and she named it Radha. <laughs> and the girl's about 11 or 12 years old today. I think maybe even a little early, older. She told me that story directly. And so it's something I didn't hear secondhand. I heard it directly from her. <laughs> so how did Radharani know that she, you know, that she wanted the apple? And how did the Pajari know who to give the apple to? <laughs> So this, this is the magic of Krishna consciousness. If we have, if we are open, if we're in, if we're just simple in heart, if we remain very simple, then all of this becomes easy to experience. When we get a little too complicated in our life, we can't somehow or other perceive all of the sweetness that is available. But when the devotees go in front of the deity, each experience they, they encounter is something very nice. It's not like we get tired. Oh, I saw the deity yesterday. No, I want to see the deity again today. Our devotee always feels eager to go and take darshan. It's never something that's old or I've seen it. But like that. Thanks for reminding me of that story. It's a story I had forgotten for a few years, but thank you. Beautiful story. We can only hope one day we can be touched like that by their Lordship. As long as we stay in Krishna consciousness, we have something equally as good or even better. Krishna relates to each and every devotee accordingly. And sometimes even in the most remote persons who don't seem to be so devoted, they get so much reciprocation with Krishna that it becomes incredible. We can't really see Krishna. <laughs> Yeah, let's focus. Focus. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Jai Shri That was, thank you, Maharaj. Very sweet. <laughs> Any other devotees? <laughs> Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj, um, Dheeraj Prabhu uh, sent a question to me. Uh, he said he, he was having a problem with network. Uh, so uh, he's watching through Facebook now. Um, so he's asking how to control our mind through the material attraction. Like most of the time we have to stay out with family and outside people. How to... How to control yeah. our mind through um, through the material attractions, by the material attractions, which we have. 
Well, there's different ways. As you become more fixed in Krishna consciousness, automatically your attraction for the material energy starts to reduce. At least in the form of trying to enjoy that material energy, you don't you don't feel any need for an enjoyment. You may see the beauty of the material energy as a reflection of Krishna's energy, but not in the terms of trying to trying to enjoy it. The devotee doesn't try to enjoy it, but they may appreciate the beauty of some element of that is considered beautiful by material standards. But that's natural. When we try to enjoy these things, then we are then we are trapped by that desire. So our enjoyment should be found in our relationship with Krishna and not into the the forms of this material world that appear and disappear just like uh, the uh, the bubbles on the water. The water. You pour water into a glass, sometimes it bubbles up, and but after a few seconds, the bubbles start to go. So the forms in this world are, are ephemeral. And therefore they appear and disappear in due course of time. But in the spiritual realm, everything is eternally situated in its natural constitutional position. So nothing becomes less and it all only becomes more by the process of our own bhakti. So each time as we increase in our devotional service and our attraction for Krishna increases, then we can, Krishna reveals more and more of his opulence to the devotee. We are naturally attracted to Krishna. So, it's not like we're trying to do something that is something artificial or trying to learn something. Just uh, turning our attraction away from the temporary forms of this world and attracting towards Krishna is just the process of bhakti. Yeah? But sometimes we may inadvertently become attracted to something in this world, but then just don't become attached to it, that's all. Note your attraction and say, oh yes, it looks very nice, but actually there's nothing there that I can find happiness in. It's, it's part of our conditioned nature. It will become less as our attraction for Krishna becomes more. Everything is done in proportion. So hearing about Krishna, going to the temple and um, standing before the deity, offering prayers to the deity, that is, it's called ikshanam. Ikshanam is just, it's just appreciating the qualities of Krishna. There's no service involved. So sometimes we go to the deity and we just look at the beautiful form of the deity. That's a form of bhakti. It's a, it's a mood, it's called ikshanam, it's appreciating. It's more like in the mood of Shankaras. There's no service there, but there's a sense of appreciation, a, a sense of attraction, a sense of wonder, a sense of humility also comes with that. All of these different qualities we experience when we are in contact with Krishna. So that's why Prabhupada set up these temples all around the world so we get attracted to Krishna. <laughs> Krishna is he's the best dresser, he never dresses the same each day. He's always got a new dress, different dress. You see the deity one day. You get an experience, you see the deity in another day, and you get another experience.
Yes, Guru Maharaj. Yeah. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. So even um, as uh, Jayashri Mataji was saying that um, about the uh, new people, how they get attracted uh, to the deities. So even now, um, after so many years, um, even I feel the same, Guru Maharaj, every time I go to temple, especially ISKCON temples are very opulent and uh, they dress so nicely. Um, um, and uh, so it's so wonderful always to see um, Krishna, Radha Krishna dress so nicely. Um, yeah, it's always very nice, Guru Maharaj. Um, especially in ISKCON temples, um, Dressing is so opulent. Yeah. What's Brahmapad's favorite color on the deities? Who knows? Brahmapad also expressed his favorite colors for the deities. Was it blue, blue Maharaj? Blue and uh, peach. Blue and peach or orange. Blue and orange kind of peach and orange combination. Close. <laughs> White, usually. From what I understood, it's blue and white, kind of a, a kind of a light blue color, not a deep, not a dark blue, light blue and white. Which I love that particular uh, color arrangement. Thank you, thank you, Maharaj. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. If you go to Milano in Hare Krishna Villaggio, you'll see that the altar. It's all designed in blue and white. The altar itself. Yes, Shidevi Mataji, you have a question? You're on mute, Mataji. Shidevi, you're on. Your voice is breaking, Shidhavi Mataji. We can't hear you. We can't hear your voice. Maybe do you want to type it? Do you want to type your question? I'll read it for you. Uh, you'll be more audible if you speak really slow. Do you want to try it, Mataji, saying very slow? Just unmute yourself. Uh, dear Guru Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. Yes, Guru Maharaj, Krishna is so attractive. And his beautiful form in the temple is just mesmerizing. As uh, Srimati rightly said, that all our temples are so gorgeous and the deity uh, standards are so high that people are just enchanted by the form of Krishna, especially the beautiful jewelry, the beautiful dresses, the turbans, the garlands made so lovingly by the devotees and offered so lovingly that uh, it's a very, very beautiful, very attractive um, sight to behold. Now, we come to other temples, like right now I'm in a temple complex, a South Indian temple complex, and there are deities here also, and they're doing some puja and everything. But the decorations and the level of worship is, of course, very different. And I see people coming for one minute or two minutes maximum, they stand hold their hands and they walk away after that there's nothing much there and sometimes i see all kinds of things they do they cross their legs then they start bending at the knees and doing some kind of curtsy then they slap themselves on both cheeks then they pinch both their ears and they you know bob up and down again with bent knees and i don't know what all that is um i find it very strange but uh, basically, the whole thing is over in 30 seconds to one minute, and they go after that. Well, in our temples, everyone comes, and they're just waiting for the curtains to open and see the deities, and there's nice kirtan. And of course, the arti is beautiful, the ghee lamp, and the flowers, and the water, and the kerchief, and everything. It's offered so nicely, the peacock fan, chamara. It's such a beautiful sight. 
that how people are naturally very attracted to our temples. I just want to say that. Yeah. A lot of money was waiting for you. What are you doing? <laughs> Yeah. I'm just looking at a picture in my room here. I have a picture of the entire altar of Radha Madhava and the Astasaki. It's a huge framed picture. It covers half the wall. Krishna is dressed in red and white. You know, mostly white with red trimmings and all the garlands are red. And all the embroidery within the outfit is also different, uh, different patterns of red. Right, nice. <laughs> I go to see Radha Madhava every day, and it's always so amazing. And I, I, I think I see Radha Madhava in the morning. For Mangal Arti, and then I see Radha Madhava after for Darshan Arti later in the morning. And both are nice, but Mangal Arti just blows you over. I mean, it's just like, whoa. And it's just like you're stunned. You're just looking, you're just looking at the deity and thinking, Krishna. <laughs> It's like an experience. So Mangalarti here is just like amazing. And if you look at his, if you look at Krishna standing on Krishna's side, it's beautiful. But if you if you go on Radharani's side and look at Krishna, wow, it's even better. 20 times better, maybe minimum. Because when you go on Radharani's side and you look at Krishna, you're seeing a little extra. You don't see what you're on Krishna's side looking at Krishna. <laughs> it happens with all of the deities that I there. You can also try that yourself. And you'll see there's something special. And it's always in our temples, the ladies always get to stand on Radharani's side. <laughs> and the men always have to stand on Krishna's side. <laughs> Except at Bhaktivedanta Manor, which is the other way around. <laughs> it's the only place I know where the women have to stand on Radha Krishna's side. <laughs> anyway. If you go to right, if you go to, uh, of course, you go to Radha Rad Lahavishwar, no matter where you stand, it's nice. <laughs> yeah, there's so many amazing stories attached to the deities and their relationships with the devotees and their coming to, to the temple. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Thank you so much. Come back. Oh, yes, Guru Maharaj. Oh, yes. <laughs> Can't wait. Okay. I went to Iskon Khargar temple today, and so I have got some life back in me now. <laughs> Good. Okay, so if there's no more questions, we can depart. Mm -hmm. Maharaj, uh, I have a question uh, last minute. Is it okay? Yeah, don't forget the announcement. Mm -hmm. Yes, Gurmaj. Yeah. Um, Gurmaj, uh, it's uh, from yesterday's class. Um, so you were talking about the service uh, which we'll do and uh, however we do the service, Krishna will uh, kindly accept our service. But uh, 
Uh, what about the devotees, Guru Maharaj? Like, suppose we don't know whether Krishna likes our service or not, but sometimes devotees around us are not happy with our service. Um, or they may find any faults or they give feedbacks. So at that time, how we would know? So should we try to please the devotees or should we think that um, Krishna will take care or Krishna is accepting my service? Um, so how should we um, think at no. that time? I think if, if the devotees, especially those who are taking care of the temple, if, there's, if they're trying to help you to improve your service, you should accept that. Because if you think, well, I, what I'm doing is good enough, then you're in the wrong consciousness. <laughs> Even if it is good enough, it's not good enough. So we have to think that um, should, am I pleasing the devotees around me? Um, in that um, way, we have to think, Guru Maharaj. We should try to please the devotees. Okay. Mm. We should try to please Krishna. Mm. So if the devotees are pleased, Krishna will be pleased? Mm. When Krishna is pleased, Prabhupada said, he's been asked that question many times. How do we know if Krishna is pleased by our service? Prabhupada said, because you are intimately connected to Krishna. And if you feel pleased, that means Krishna was pleased. Mm. If you feel satisfied, then Krishna was satisfied. If you don't, then you might think, mm, I have to try a better. The, the bhakti connects us with Krishna. Mm. Yes, Guru Maharaj, yeah. I understood. Thank you so much, Guru Maharaj. I'm trying to put this according. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like you can think of different ways to please the devotees. Like here in Mayapur, do unlimited ways. We, we get flowers and we pass them out to the devotees. We we'll go to the Shringadev's altar, they give you a ton of ton of Kelsey's, and then you start passing them out. And then there's 150 people around you trying to get the unlimited amount of Kelsey's you have. Are so you pleasing the devotees by passing out the so you're very respectful and polite to all the devotees. You are, uh, when you're in Kirtan, you're trying to enthuse the devotees to chant and dance by being enthusiastic yourself. So you can think of different ways how to please the devotees. Yes, Kamash. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. So, shall I announce uh, the next class? Is good. Yeah. Hare Krishna, dear devotees. Um, tomorrow, Saturday, October 8th, uh, uh, we have a special class with the Spanish devotees. Uh, Guru Maharaj is giving at uh, 2 p.m. UK time. It will be two hours later um, from our regular time. Uh, mm -hmm. So, the Zoom link will be shared in the WhatsApp groups. Um, and also, the time is 2 p.m. UK time with the Spanish people, and it is like an interview. Mm -hmm. Uh, with Guru Maharaj. Um, Guru Maharaj is going to talk about uh, Holy Jail um, and also his experiences and, and present preaching. Uh, so uh, please join in and I'll share the Zoom link soon. Um, and also Sunday is a regular class and Monday is also a regular class, but we have another special class um, at 8 a.m. Um, IST, that is India time, 8 a.m., um, which is um, I think it's difficult for UK um, UK devotees, um, but uh, we can see it in the mayapur.tv online. It is broadcasted. It in that class is with uh, uh, Russian devotees uh, on Monday. Um, so hope to see you all soon tomorrow. Tomorrow we don't have any regular class. We'll join at 2 p.m. UK time. Um, that will be 6.30 p.m. Indian time, IST. I'll share the Zoom links. Thank you so much.
Thank you, Shrimati Mataji. Thank you, Guru Maharaj, for your time and association. Thank you. Thanks, devotees, for joining the call. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Thank you, Maharaj. Hare Krishna, dear devotees. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, Guru Maharaj. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Thank you. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Hare Krishna.